Okay, so let's start today. Um, so what did we do in the last lecture? So we were looking at pumping lemma, right? So what is a pumping lemma about? So what is the idea of the pumping lemma? So we say that if a language is regular, then there exists a number n such that for all strings z, okay, such that for all strings z and the length of z being greater than or equal to n, what we have is that there exists a decomposition 
uh, of the string z into uvw such that uh, this part, the middle part v, it is not epsilon and the length of uv is less than or equal to n. And what happens is that if you pump the part v arbitrarily many times, it is still in L. Right. So this was the pumping lemma. So the pumping lemma says that if L is regular, then you then uh, for this particular language L, there exists an N such that for all springs whose length is greater than or equal to N, there exists a decomposition, right? So there exists a decomposition of Z into UVW such that the middle part V is not epsilon and you can pump it arbitrarily many times and the resultant string is also in L. Clear? Now, uh, what we said, the important thing, another important way of looking at it is the contrapositive, right? So what does the contrapositive do? It says that for all M, there exists, so you can choose whatever you, whatever N you want, there exists a string Z, such that the length of the string Z is greater than or equal to N, and for all possible decompositions of Z, for all possible decompositions of Z, such that this uh, Z equal to UVW and V is not epsilon and UV is less than or equal to N, there exists, exists an integer I such that you can pump V I, I times. Okay. And the resultant string is not in L. Correct. So in whatever way you decompose, Z in whatever way you decompose Z, you can find an integer i such that you can pump v i times and the resultant string is not in uh, L. Clear? And whatever n you choose, you can still find a z in the language, a string z in the language L, so that in again in whatever way you decompose z into uvw such that you can pump the v and the resultant string uh, i mean you can so so there exists some uh, number i so that you can pump the v some i times and the resultant string is not in a clear so this is what we saw and then we also looked at the converse of the pumping lemma so what does the pumping lemma say pumping lemma says that if l is regular then this pumping you can do the pumping now we ask that if you can do the pumping, is L regular? We, say, we saw that the answer is negative, right? If you can indeed pump, it's not necessary that L has to be regular. It is possible that L is not regular and we saw an example, correct? In fact, uh, we saw this particular example where L is not regular, right? And uh, it's still the pumping lemma. You can still pump, right? The pumping lemma still holds here. Okay. So the dollar was the V. The dollar was the V, which you can pump. And essentially, if you pump it arbitrarily many times, the resultant stream is still in L. Correct. So the converse of the pumping lemma is not, it's not true. Clear? Okay. So and then we looked at some examples of pumping lemma to show essentially that a language is not regular. Clear? So we proved that the language is not regular using pumping lemma. Right? So how did we show this? By looking at the contrapositive. Correct? Right. So for every n, you can still find some z. Given the n, you can still find the z such that in whatever way you decompose, there still exists some pumping, some number of times you can pump the uh, in intermediate string v so that the resultant language is not in l. Right. So we looked at all these things. Correct. So today we are going to start with yet another okay but maybe uh, before we get into that let's quickly look at some decision problems for regular languages for 
regular languages. Uh, so for example, suppose you were given a DFA or an NFA. Suppose you are given a DFA or an NFA A, how do you check if LA is empty or not? Clear the question? So we are talking about the non-emptiness or the emptiness problem. Non-emptiness problem, whether it is empty, non-empty or not. How do you check this? There should be a path. Some path from initial state to final state, right? Non-empty language. If there is a path from the initial state to a final state. Okay, good. Next, suppose we want to check there are two DFA or NFA, right? DFA, NFA, A1 and A2. And what I want to check if they are equivalent, language equivalent in the sense LA1 equal to LA2. How do you do that? How do you check the language equivalence of this? automata How can you check if they're equivalent? Right? So one, yeah. So one way to do this is right. So Exactly. So you can do it. Check this. Right? You can check whether the language accepted by A1 is a subset of the language accepted by A2 and vice versa. Correct? And this you know how to check. For example, just for this part, you know how to check this. You take Complement not equal to empty, right? Right, so and suppose these are DFA, and so you can complement, you can take the intersection and you can construct another DFA and you can check its emptiness, right? So you can do all this. Now, suppose I ask for a DFA or an NFA. Suppose this is given A, I want to check if LA equal to sigma star. How do you do that? Okay, so, so then LA equal to sigma star if and only if, oops, if and only if L of A bar, where A bar is the complement automaton. Okay, the automaton accepting the complement language equal to empty. Clear? Okay, so suppose you are given a DFA and I say A again. So how do you check if the language A is an infinite language, right? So is an infinite set. So that means it has infinitely many strings. How do you check that? Hmm? 
you should check for a loop right you should check for a loop and then wherever there is a loop there should be a path to the final state also and the loop should also be reachable from initial state correct so i think this is fine okay so let's look at uh, some more application of homomorphism some more application of homomorphism uh so suppose there is this language l which is of the form a n b a n okay and this is the thing right so it seems to be quite intuitive that this language is not regular right so what we would like you to do is that prove that is not regular okay so i maybe i'll just give you some hint so we would like to define something like another alphabet 0 comma 1 and do some homomorphism or inverse homomorphism and reduce this using the homomorphism and inverse homomorphism would like to get the language 0 and 1 clear okay see applying homomorphism and inverse homomorphism we would like to get this language and since we know that regular languages are closed under homomorphism and inverse homomorphism right so and since by applying those homomorphism and inverse homomorphism we get this correct which we know which we have seen earlier that this is not regular we'll say that this is not regular okay so what i would suggest is that uh maybe you can take this as a homework and then we will discuss this during the next lecture okay okay so this is one such application next we are going to look at something called ultimate periodicity so we have in fact seen this thing ultimate period periodicity in some form earlier also okay so we have seen ultimate periodicity earlier also in some form so so what is u u is a set of natural numbers okay so we are saying that let u be a subset of n okay the set u is ultimately periodic okay so again we are looking at this in the context of homomorphism some applications of homomorphism so we are going to look at some some uh properties of regular languages okay if there exist numbers n greater than equal to 0 and p greater than equal to p greater than 0 okay so p is positive and a is non negative such that for all m 
greater than or equal to n, we have that n belongs to u, right? So what is u again? The ultimately periodic set, right? So u is a u is the ultimately periodic set, and we are trying to define this, right? And u is a subset of n. So we are saying that this is ultimately periodic if there exists such numbers, and we have that. So there is some non-negative n, some positive p, such that for all n greater than or equal to n, what do we have? If and only if m plus p belongs to u. Okay, so we call this p to be the period of the set, period of u. Right? So let's say if I'm looking at an example, so you have this set, let's say 1, 5, 6, 12, 16, 18, 20, 24. and so on, right? Correct? So I have these, uh, uh, these, these numbers, right? I mean, so it's an infinite state I'm talking about. Now I can consider suppose n equal to 18 and p equal to six. Okay, so you see, that essentially, I mean, I can maybe extend a bit more like 36, 38, 42, etc. So the idea is the following. So for all m greater than or equal to n, we are saying that m belongs to u if and only if m plus p belongs to it. So the p is this. Okay. So you consider this thing starting from. Uh, so 18 is there. So if 18 is there, then 24 also has to be there. Correct? Period is 6. 30 also has to be there. 36 also has to be there. 42 also has to be there, there and so on. Correct? And this n and p, n and p are not necessarily unique. Not necessarily unique. Okay, so you can also consider your n to be 20 and p equal to 12, let's say. So here you have 22 is there, 32 is there, then we are also going to have 44, which I didn't write and so on and so forth. Is it okay? So you can have, like you are given the set. So all we are saying is that you consider a number n, which is greater than equal to zero, non-negative, and a positive number p, which is the p, which is a period of this ultimately periodic set, such that for all m greater than equal to n, if m is there, then m plus p has to be there and vice versa. Correct, and then we are saying that they are not necessarily unique, right? Now, so there is something that I want to write here is that there is a strong relation, strong relation between what? Between regular languages over a singleton alphabet, singleton alphabet and ultimately periodic sets. You can possibly already see that, but let me write it. And we did something like this earlier. 
okay so we are talking about ultimately periodic steps suppose let l is a subset of a star then l is regular if and only if the set m okay what is m it's the length of the strings in this length of the strings which are in l so that is the set the set of those lengths we are talking about length of the strings length of the members in l okay is ultimately periodic so what are we talk what are we saying so suppose you have a language l suppose you have a language l which is over a single ton alphabet a clear now we are saying that now you consider the length of the string feature in l right so that will form some subset of natural numbers and we are saying that if that l is regular then the subset will be ultimately periodic and also vice versa so you consider any language l right and you consider the member or the words in that language you consider the lengths right and you have the set now if that set is ultimately periodic then the language l is regular clear so how do we do the proof let's do one direction and you think you can also do the other direction so suppose l is regular right then what happens you can consider a dfa so consider a dfa for l how will the and you see that you have a single letter here correct in the alphabet right single ton alphabet so how will the dfa look like you will, it will look like a lasso so you have something and then it will go like this right and there can be so this is your initial state and there can be some final states at different places like there can be some other states and some final states correct so this is how so with this magenta and referring to the final state so this is how the dfa will look like correct and now you can say that see the set of strings okay which are accepted they are accepted at the at this final state and they have some length you can say that uh, if you can define you have to define a and p correct some a and p so now suppose if you define starting from here the a is here and the p can be the length of this whole cycle right is it clear okay or you can define it with this and the p is going to be the whole cycle so you can define the n and the p for what for the other yeah so suppose this one right so you can consider suppose your the the, the cycle is in this direction clockwise correct right and so suppose you consider this one right so you can say that your a is starting from here the length that you get in and the p is the length of the cycle the p is the length of the cycle so for example just look at this thing right so you can consider you can consider 
that there exist such numbers n and p such that for all m greater than equal to n you have m belongs to u if and only if m plus p belongs to u right so suppose your you start your n to be of this length correct you start from here now for everything so suppose now you consider your m to be this one now m is here if and only if m plus p is there and p is the length of this cycle of this loop in the dfa this is there if and only if this plus p right the length this is here correct and similarly this is there if this the length of the string a length of the string which starting from here in the df it has a run which ends here right so this is the length of a string suppose the string is called i call it u now the length of the string is u and the length of the cycle is say p right so if so a u a u belongs to l correct and we are saying a u plus p also belongs to l clear okay so we have seen one direction what about the other direction suppose suppose uh the length of the strings in l form an ultimately periodic set ultimately periodic set what do we want to say we want to prove that l is regular right so if this is ultimately periodic set then you know that there exists some n and there exists some p right so this is greater than 0 this is greater than equal to 0 correct and what do you know for all m greater than equal to n right you have m belongs to u so this is my u u and only if m plus p belongs to u correct right so now can you form such a dfa if this is the case yeah so you can put so for example here from this thing you can find such an n right so suppose you find such an n which is like much like this find such an n right and suppose this is you can consider this to be like it's already in the set suppose you can consider such an n okay which is already in the set so that means that it should be an accepting state right of so if you consider an in length path starting from the beginning it's going to be an accepting state because it's in the set right yeah right and then you can sorry and then you can make a cycle of length p you can make a cycle of length p and then also appropriately put some of the other states as final states by looking at the ultimately periodic set right and one thing to note is that you can have several periods so actually i mean just so you can have a period p1 p2 etc correct like we said that the period is not un unique you can have period 
P1, P2, etc. Right? So if you have such finitely many periods, you have such finitely many periods. What you can do, you can take the period P to be. Why are there finitely many periods? Because there exists an n beyond which, beyond which, if it is like, if a number exists, then it, that m plus p also has to exist. Correct. So you can have such uh, such finitely many periods, and then you can take the LCM of these periods, right? If you have multiple such periods, you can you can take the LCM of these periods to get a period p, which will be the length of this cycle. Okay, think about it like, uh, okay. So you can have multiple, many such periods, right? Like we said that for example, P equal to 12 here, P equal to six, correct? So all I'm saying is that you can consider the LCM of these periods. In this case, six and 12, like 12 is the LCM, but suppose it is six and 17, right? If it is six and 17, then the LCM is let's say 102. So you'd like to make a cycle of 102 of length 102 and then put the appropriate uh, states as the accepting state in the cycle. Clear? Okay. Any question? Okay, so think about this, like, so we are stating here that uh, we should have, if we, I mean, this can be an assumption that we can have, like, let's say you have finitely many periods. Um, or does it come from the, there exists an N, so. So let's say uh, there exists an N such that for all n greater than or equal to n, n plus p belongs to this set if and only if n belongs to this set, right? Correct. So you have, somewhere you have to decide on the n, right? Somewhere you decide on the n and then you have to talk about all the numbers after this. So suppose your n may be even 26, whatever you take, n is 26, okay? And then you are going to talk about every number which is for all n greater than or equal to n. So for all these numbers, you have to talk about it. Okay. So think about this and then let's maybe uh, discuss during the next lecture, right? So the question is, does the definition gives finitely many periods okay yes okay so next now we are just going to have a corollary of this. So what are we saying? We are saying application of 
homomorphism and in the context of ultimately periodic sets. Okay, so what is the corollary? Suppose now I consider any arbitrary alphabet sigma. Okay. So earlier we were considering a singleton alphabet, but now we are talking about any arbitrary finite alphabet. Let L be any regular set over a finite alphabet. Sigma. Okay. Now I consider the set of lengths of the words in L. Okay. The set M such that length of X equal to M and X belongs to L. Correct. So I'm considering the length of all strings which are in this regular set L. But note that now the alphabet is not singleton anymore. Okay. And we are saying that this set is also, this set is also ultimately periodic. How do you prove this? How do you prove this? So now if you directly think of it, you are not going to get a single cycle, right? Because you have different letters in the alphabet, correct? But we are just looking at the length of the strings. We are not interested in anything else. What can you do? From? Sorry. So I can consider a homomorphism. So suppose, yeah, H sigma to A, right? Something like this. Correct? If you do this, then of course the length of the strings, which are going to be accepted, that remains the same. Right? So the strings are going to be only concatenations of letters, concatenation of letters A, but the length of the strings is it remains the same. And then I can use the previous result. Correct? So the previous theorem after applying the homomorphism. Clear enough? Right? Okay. So, so these are the two things. So one thing is you should let me know in the next lecture, like how you can use homomorphism or inverse homomorphism, or it can be both of them also. And can you prove indeed that this is not regular? Okay. I mean, maybe there are other ways to prove that, but all I'm saying is that can you prove that using homomorphism, inverse homomorphism, etc. And secondly, this is something I'll also try to think over this. So the definition, does it give finitely many periods um, or do we need that extra assumption? Uh, and if you have like multiple such periods, then the length of the cycle, you can consider finitely many such periods. Then the P is the LCM of, of these periods, okay? Right. So now we are going to look at yet another characterization of regular languages. Regular languages. So what kind of characterization so far we saw? We saw acceptance by DFA, acceptance by NFA. We saw acceptance by epsilon NFA, right? So I wouldn't say pumping lemma is like a, so these are the characterizations. These are the characterizations. But I wouldn't say 
that pumping lemma is really a characterization in the sense that it's a one way application right which is regular languages satisfy the pumping lemma but it's not the other way around right the converse is not necessarily true right on the other hand here when i'm talking about this characterization so i'm saying that if there is a regular language we also saw another thing which is regular expressions correct we also saw regular expressions right so what are this like if there is a regular expression then there is it corresponds to a like there is a dfa so for example i mean so if there is a regular expression r then we know that the language l of r and there exists a corresponding dfa for example how we defined initially regular languages correct and such that this is equal to l of a correct where this is a dfa right and this holds for like this is there is a kind of an equivalence right for each of them so the by implication holds it's an if and only for all these but for pumping lemma it's not exactly that it's a one way implication clear so now we are going to talk about another characterization which is called which is which is called is this something called a myhill neerob theorem okay so again this is like a if and don't leave relation okay so you know what is an equivalence relation to start with equivalence relation so this is reflexive symmetric and transitive okay uh and so if i have for example suppose you consider uh an equivalence relation r on set some set a okay so that means r is a subset of a cross a and uh, equivalence relations you know they induce partitions correct partitions of set a and so the partition corresponding to an element a belonging to a we are going to denote by this thing a in square bracket okay so for example a this r equal to the set of x belonging to a such that x is in the same partition as a okay okay so equivalence classes so what i meant here is that equivalence classes form partition of the set clear enough okay so now in order to prove my hill road theorem we are going to talk about something called distinguishability of strings distinguishability of strings right suppose a is a language suppose l is a language over sigma okay now we say that two strings x and y right x and y in sigma star are distinguishable with respect to l with respect to l correct so what are we saying it's distinguishable with respect to l if 
there exists a string z if there exists z again in sigma star such that xz belongs to l okay and yz does not belong to l or it's the other way around xz does not belong to l and yz belongs to l okay so then you say x and y are distinguishable with respect to l when are we saying it's distinguishable when there exists such a string such that when you are concatenating it to both uh, x and y so the resultant strings are xz and yz exactly one of them should belong to l the other one should not belong belong to l clear so then we are saying that x and y are distinguished by string z by z okay and x and y are indistinguishable x and y are indistinguishable if indistinguishable with respect to l if no such z exists clear okay so for example if you consider an language l let's say it's a set w such that w belongs to 0 1 star right and w ends with uh, w ends with 0 1 let's say ends with the string 0 1 right then if you consider let's say x equal to 0 1 0 and y equal to 1 1 1 0 they are not so they are not distinguishable right if x is 0 1 0 and y is 1 1 1 0 are they distinguishable or are they indistinguishable with respect to l sorry sorry yeah okay so you see that it's end with 0 1 but i put it like 1 0 here okay and whatever so you can add a 1 here and a 1 here and if you put a zero here, then also like if you put up one here, both belongs to L. Put a zero here doesn't belong to L, doesn't belong to L. Right? So X and Y here are X and Y are indistinguishable. With respect to L. Now what about if I consider U equal to one one zero one? and v equal to 0, 0, 1, 1, they are clearly distinguishable. And what is the distinguishable string here? Z epsilon. So epsilon distinguishes u and v. Okay, good. So now I'll write an important theorem which we are going to use in the characterization. Right, so I just distinguishability and finite and DFA deterministic finite. State. So what is this theorem? What does this theorem state? So suppose L, L which is a subset of sigma star, L is a language. It Suppose this is regular, okay, and n be a positive integer, integer such that such that there are n strings, there are in strings and there exist uh, 
right suppose there are in strings that are pairwise distinguishable with respect to l okay is it clear the statement so i'm saying that suppose you are given a regular language l and there are n strings okay which are pairwise distinguishable with respect to l right then my claim is that there doesn't exist then there does not exist any dfa dfa with less than n states less than n states that recognizes n how do you prove this clear there doesn't exist any dfa which is less than instead set this is very easy to suppose you can prove by contradiction right so by you can prove by contradiction suppose indeed there exists a dfa with suppose there exists a dfa with less than n states then two of the strings right so suppose this is u and this is w two of the strings by starting from q0 would reach the same state q correct and then there doesn't exist any z such that which can distinguish u and w after that what was the definition of two strings being distinguishable like there should exist a string distinguishing them correct such that u z belongs to l but w z doesn't belong to l or vice versa other way around w z belongs to l uh, and u z doesn't belong correct so this was the thing but if they are reaching by u and w by reaching uh, by reading them you reach the same state q of course you cannot distinguish them anymore hence you get the contradiction clear enough okay so it's that simple and now we are going to talk about something called a distinguishability relation ability relation so what is distinguishability relation let's try to see actually yeah maybe we'll talk about an indistinguishability relation okay so what is this indistinguishability relation um so essentially you can understand possibly from the name that if suppose i call this denote this by il right i denote this by il so x i l y if and only if x and y are indistinguishable with respect to a language with respect to this language indistinguishable indistinguishable sorry to language l correct 
So this is the indistinguishable little relation. Correct. Now what we say is that, so I just talked about the definition and now, right? So this relation is in fact IL for language L, right? And X and Y are related by this indistinguishability relation Right? X and Y are related by this indistinguishability relation IL if and only if X and Y are indistinguishable with respect to set. Clear? So that means, so what does it mean? It means for every Z, for every Z, this essentially means that for all Z, XZ belongs to L if and only if YZ, sorry, YZ, belongs to L. Clear? This is what it means. Right? This means, right? So this is exactly we are saying when X, I, L, Y, what does it mean? So this is what essentially correct. Okay. Now I have a lemma, which is for, it's again very easy to see for every language L, the relation IL is an, what kind of relation is it? Is an equivalence relation. This is what you said? Sorry? I don't understand. Is it transitive? Yeah, it is, right? Because what, what do you see? So suppose it is reflexive, correct? It's reflexive, easy to see or not? Right? Of course, this will hold if you replace the Y with an X. It's reflexive. X cannot be distinguished with respect to itself. X is indistinguishable with respect to X. If X and Y, if X L Y, X I L Y, implies y i l x this is clear right again so symmetric right and is it transitive so if you cannot distinguish x and y and if you cannot distinguish y and z then you cannot distinguish x and z Clear? X, I, L, X, I, L, Y, and Y, I, L, some W implies X, I, L, W. Clear enough? Right? If you cannot distinguish X and Y, and if you cannot distinguish Y and W, then you cannot distinguish X and W either, right? So it's transitive and hence this indistinguishability relation is an equivalence relation. Clear? Question? Okay. Now we are going to define a very important relation which is called the myhill narrowed relation. We are going to define what is called a myhill narrowed relation. What is a myhill narrow relation? So first of all, we are going to talk about some properties of the relation. So first of all, it has to be something called right congruence. Okay. So suppose there is an equivalence relation. So first of all, an equivalence relation on sigma star. We are considering an equivalence relation on sigma star. Okay. 
is a right congruence right if for all x y z belonging to sigma star we have x is equivalent to y implies that x w is also equivalent to y w okay right so you have an equivalence relation to start with and this equivalence relation is a right congruence if whenever x and y are in the same class same equivalence class then if you add something to the right concatenate it with some w then that also they are also in the the resultant streams are also in the same equivalence class so x w and y w are also related in the same equivalence class right so this is called then you say that this equivalence relation is a right congruence clear i mean you could have also defined something called a left congruence if you have to put the w to the left but for my hill narrow relation we just need right congruence clear then we are talking about a notion of refinement what is this notion of refinement now again an equivalence relation is said to refine it or it refines a language l l if suppose if you have this then x belongs to l if and only if y belongs to l if they are in the same class and if one of them belongs to l the other one also has to belong to l right it's like it's refining a language l you know when a relation refines another relation and when does an equivalence relation refines another equivalence relation so that so this idea of refinement is more general i mean you can use this in the context of equivalence relation so suppose just to put it very intuitively so suppose you have two relations r1 and r2 right you say that r1 is a refinement of r2 so we say so this is an equivalence so this two are equivalence relations okay now i say r1 is a refinement of r2 if x r1 y implies x r2 y okay essentially if you want to look at it visually what it means is that suppose you have some classes of r1 or suppose you have some classes of r2 so these are classes of r2 and now you can consider the classes of r1 to be as if like obtained by splitting the classes of right r2 like this so this is r1 classes right so this is why it's called a refinement okay so we are talking about the refinement and then finite index when does an equivalent relation have finite index what is the notion of finite index so the partition has finitely many classes the partition that is being induced by the equivalence relation has only finitely many classes right so finitely many equivalence classes right so this is finite index so we talked about right congruence we talked about refinement it refines a language l and so on now we define now we are giving the definition an equivalence 
relation is called a myhill mirror relation it's a myhill mirror relation if myhill mirror relation say i have to also talk about this l for language l right i have not said anywhere that l has to be regular right it's just some language l so an equivalence relation so the language has to be an equivalence relation right a myhill mirror relation has to be an equivalence relation and it's a myhill mirror relation for language l if it is if it is a right congruence right refines l and is of finite index clear so if you have all these three properties every equivalence relation which is a right congruence which refines language l and which is a finite index it's called a myhill mirror relation for language l clear okay now we'll talk about uh we'll see how myhill mirror relations are again related to dfa myhill mirror relations and dfa we are going to see that okay so suppose you are given a dfa suppose a is a dfa q sigma delta q0 f is a dfa right i consider a relation now sigma star okay define this relation as so x is related to y if and only if delta star q0 comma x equal to delta star q0 comma y so what does it mean so if by reading x and y in the dfa you are reaching the same string same state from q0 then the two strings are related clear okay so essentially the states reached from u0 by reading x and y are the same right now we have a lemma which you will have to help me proving this that this relation correct this relation is a myhill mirror relation right so first of all you have to show so what are we going to prove like first that this is an equivalence relation right this is an equivalence relation this is clear right from the definition okay next what do we prove is a right congruence right this is also this is also easy right right so essentially if you have so what it's easy to see that if this is the case then for all z 
what do we have x z y z x z is related to y z so this is the right congruence clear what about the third one this should refine l right so if y and if x belongs to l then y belongs to l and if y belongs to l then this is also easy to see clear what else finite index right so finite index right because the number of equivalence classes number of equivalence classes equals q clear good so now let me give you a small exercise i should have drawn this but let me do this quickly take much time so i have a state like this have a state like this and this and then another two states like this and draw this 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 okay and um, suppose this is sorry this is a this is b this is okay a comma b so it's uh, uh, so sigma here is a b this set so i'll just write sigma here sigma 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 okay sigma is a b clear and here is my these are my final states okay now uh so define the two relations this and i of l So what in terms of the equivalence classes, right? So first, maybe you can tell me this thing. What are the equivalence classes? Epsilon, A, B. I'm just writing the regular expressions, not the sets really. Okay, then A, A plus B star. A A plus A plus B A plus B star correct because this is A and then A A plus B A plus B star so essentially A plus B this is what right yeah and then similarly B A plus B A plus B star. Correct. What about I n? The indistinguishability relation. So this is indistinguishable with respect to n. So x and y are indistinguishable if, for all z, x z belongs to L. Then y z all belongs to L and vice versa. Correct. Okay. So epsilon. Then you have a plus b.
A and B should be in the same this thing, right? Is it, are they in the same class or not? A, is it true? They are, right? Yes. Correct. And then further you have A plus B plus B plus B star. Right? Clear? Right? So this example is not too difficult to see, but this is going to give something very important. Okay, so we considered this relation and we considered the indistinguishability relation. So what we note here is that here the number of classes is one, two, three, four, five. Here the number of classes is three. Okay, okay. Um, right. And there is a simple question, another one. So suppose if it happens that if X belongs to L and Y belongs to L, is it the case? Is it true that X and Y are indistinguishable? Is it true? So both of them are in language L, but are they indistinguishable necessarily? Might be. They might be. I mean, I'm asking that is it always true? Is it necessary that if X and Y, both of them belong to language L, correct? Where L is, let's say, regular. I mean, if, is it necessary that they have to belong to L? They are indistinguishable. If X and Y are in L, are they indistinguishable necessarily? Is it always the case? Why? Yeah, can it happen? Sorry, in general? You can, can you consider in terms of a DFA? Suppose X, suppose there's a regular language. Okay, L is a regular language, there's a DFA. X belongs to L and Y belongs to L, right? So is it necessary that they have to be indistinguishable? The accepting states can be different, right? So it can happen that starting from Q0, right, you can read X, you can go here, some QF1, read Y, you can go and re go to some QF2, correct? It's not necessary that from here, if you read A, you may go to some state which is non-accepting. If you read A here, it may go to an accepting state. This is possible, correct, in general. So as an example, maybe you recall that we had 
this language where the set of binary strings, right? You, we had this set of, if you recall that we looked at this language set of binary strings whose decimal equivalent, if you consider decimal equivalent, right? And the remainder is either one or two. Remainder is either one or two when uh, divided by three, right? For the mod three, decimal equivalent. And then you consider mod three. You recall, like we looked at this language and the remainder is either one or two. So for example, if you have one, one, zero, right? So here the, uh the remainder is zero one one maybe one zero one the remainder here is two correct so i'm saying that so the language was like this the remainder is there one or two and then we saw that in order to accept this language a dfa would need at least two final states correct and the way we argued that you need at least two final states is essentially this thing that if you merge the two final states into one, then you will get a contradiction. Okay. That you, if you read a zero, you will get some word starting from some word. If you read a zero, it will be accepted. Whereas starting from another thing, right? If you read a zero, it will not be there in the language and so on. Correct. So indeed, like, so this is not true. Like this question. Okay, so the answer is no. Okay, right. Now, so suppose you are given this. Uh, so let's do this and then we are going to finish. So suppose you were uh, given a language L and Q will be the set of equivalence classes of the relation indistinguishability relation. Okay, Q will be the set of equivalence classes of the, of the indistinguishability relation, right? Now we are saying that suppose if QL is a finite set, if QL is finite, then I can construct a DFA. So I have the equivalence classes of the indistinguishability relation. And what I'm doing, I'm constructing a DFA with these uh, equivalence classes. How? The initial state Q0 corresponds to the equivalence class of epsilon. Okay. And what is the set of final states? This is all those states, correct? So these are the, what are the states? The states are the equivalence classes. Okay, my say this thing QL, like these are the set of QL is a set of equivalence classes of the indistinguishability relation. Correct. And for with this, with this equivalence classes, I'm making a DFA. Right. And I'm saying that when such a state Q in QL belongs to, so now Q belongs to the set of uh, final states of the DFA, if it happens that Q intersection L is not empty. So there is an equivalence class. There is an equivalence class in the indistinguishability relation. The equivalence class consists of several such strings. And if you take the intersection with the language L, the intersection is non-empty. So I'm saying that such classes form the final states. Clear. So this is my set of final state. And I'm going to define the transition relation, right? Which is kind of easy to see. So I have suppose X is an equivalence class. From here, I would read an A, I would go to the equivalence class of X. Clear? The DFA, how I'm going to define. So I consider the equivalence class. So given a language L, I consider the equivalence class IL, right? And I'm considering it's, consi uh, sorry, uh, uh, given the language L, I consider the indistinguishability relation IL. 
consider all its equivalence classes which become the states ql and i'm defining the final state of this automaton of this automaton as those such that there is some intersection with the language the intersection is non empty and i'm defining the transition relation is this okay now uh sorry everything in the it's yeah you can see that also right yeah right so uh since it's the indistinguishability relation with respect to l so indeed q intersection l not equal to phi so it means that q is a subset of l correct you are right good that you see this right now what we are saying that in, indeed this automaton that we defined in this way first of all right we have to show that indeed it is the case that this ml the language of ml is l itself okay and also ml has the has the least number of states least number of states it's already written above least number of states among all dfa accepting n clear is it okay so we are so again look at this so we are going to start from this in the during the less, next uh, lecture but just think about this how to prove this it's not again very difficult right so one thing we are going to show is that indeed l of ml the language accepted by this is the same as l right so how would we do this in two directions right so first you say maybe we can try to finish it off l of ml is a subset of l right okay and the other we are going to l is a subset of l of ml right so this second direction is actually easy to see suppose x belongs to l suppose x belongs to l okay so we are going to prove that l is a subset of ml okay how are you going to prove this suppose x belongs to l suppose l is a subset of ml so suppose yeah so we are going to prove this l is a subset of ml suppose x belongs to l we want to prove that x a, suppose x belongs to l we are going to prove that x belongs to a of l uh sorry uh, what am i writing l of ml sorry yeah suppose x belongs to l right then right then what happens then then you have the equivalence class corresponding to x correct so if this is the case then this intersection the equivalence class is not empty by definition so then what happens is that uh, x belongs to fl right and of course there is one uh, lemma or you need to prove by induction which you can prove 
is like delta star of uh, q0 comma x equal to x correct this you need to prove so when you are reading this x indeed you reach this particular state and since x belongs to l this belongs to this this particular state right the equivalence class belongs to fl and if you read this you indeed go here hence x is there in the language of the automaton correct so this completes the direct the proof of one direction what about the other one what about the other one so this you need to prove by induction what about the other one lml is a subset of l okay so maybe you can think over this and i think we are running out of time so it's not very difficult you can finish it off yourself right so x belongs to this language of the automaton correct so that means this belongs to fl right and then what so that means this set right intersection l is not empty hmm? yeah and if and then you know that this is actually a subset of l okay right so since this entire subset is within l so it essentially means that x also so this implies that x belongs to l clear i mean this is all okay good so okay so we will finish here and the class here and uh right so any question correct so i think we looked at a uh, several uh, such definitions today so maybe you should uh, try to look at go over all these definitions uh, before the during the next before the next lecture and then we'll uh, start we'll prove the we'll prove the um my